Ms. Miles Shore, and I am professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a visiting scholar here at the Kennedy School of Government in the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this forum, and particularly a pleasure to uh, welcome our two guests. Tonight we join together to talk about the politics and teaching of evolution. That has always been a controversial topic, and it is still a controversial topic uh, in many parts of our country. The accuracy of Charles Darwin's evolutionary theories have been both rigorously defended and ardently attacked. Of course, the nation first struggled with this issue uh, officially in 1925, during the famous Scopes monkey trial in Tennessee. This historic occasion and the debate that it represented pitted the, or the proponents of evolution against the creationist belief that the Bible should be taken literally. That trial caused Americans to consider seriously the, a second issue, and that was the accuracy of education taught in public schools in light of scientific advances. While this forum tonight, we doubtless will not attract the same kind of national attention as the Scopes trial did, uh, it will certainly address these same issues with a modern viewpoint, modern both scientifically and philosophically. We have invited this evening two particularly well-qualified individuals with differing opinions to, enjoy, uh, to join us for this discussion. I will introduce each person. They will each make 10-minute opening statements, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience for the remaining time, which in total will add up to about an hour. In other words, we will finish a bit after 7 o'clock. To my right is Dr. Jonathan Wells, a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. Dr. Wells has received two PhDs, one in molecular and cell biology from the University of California at Berkeley, and another in religious studies from Yale University. He has taught biology at California State University and has published a great many articles in various publications in his field of expertise. He is also the author of two books, Questioning Darwinism. Uh, the first is Charles Hodge's Critique of Darwinism, and the other, Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth, Why Much of What We Teach About Evolution is Wrong. To my left is Dr. Stephen Palumbi, a professor of biology and curator of invertebrates in the Museum of Comparative Zoology here at Harvard University. Dr. Palumbi joined Harvard in 1996, leaving in behind, in a serious lapse of judgment, uh, his laboratory and the weather at the University of Hawaii. He's the author of a great many publications and a recent book entitled the Evolutionary Explosion, How Humans Cause Rapid Evolutionary Change. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to um, make it clear that although this was, uh, was uh, announced in some circles as a debate, uh, it's not a debate because that implies winners and losers. Instead, this is a serious discussion by two well-qualified individuals about a serious intellectual, social, and political topic that is essential for all of us to learn. Finally, let me thank a number of people who made this event possible. Rich Halfers, Josh Weiner, Julie Kobik, and Andy Frank uh, were instrumental in uh, bringing about this evening's occasion. The Institute of Politics, Science, and Technology Working Group, as well as the Kennedy School's Science and Technology Professional Interest Council all contributed to this forum. Without further ado, I will ask Dr. Wells to begin tonight's discussion. Dr. Wells. Thank you. First slide, please. I'd like to make three points briefly. First, evolution has many meanings. And some of those meanings 
it's empirically well established, while in others it's not so well established. In fact, it's highly theoretical, even speculative. Second point, Darwinism, which, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, I take to be a, a philosophical position, extrapolates the evidence for evolution in one sense to other senses, and it does this not based on scientific grounds, but on philosophical ones. And finally, because Darwinism is fundamentally a philosophical position, first of all, it is extraordinarily resistant to empirical disconfirmation, and second of all, it uh, tends to maintain its power through political means and uh, tends to be taught dogmatically. Let me back these points up. The first point, that evolution has many meanings. First of all, for some people, evolution simply means change over time. That's not what I'm discussing here. I have no quarrel with change over time. Uh, I am not a young earth creationist and never have been. The uh, literal interpretation of the Bible is not the way I read it. And whether the earth is 6,000 years old or 6 billion years old, to me, is a matter to be determined by the evidence. So change over time is not the issue. Uh, if we look at the fossil record, however, we see that things have indeed changed. Living things have changed. The things that are around us now are not what used to be here. And so things have certainly changed in this sense, and this is well established. A second sense in which evolution is well established is changes within species. Uh, changes have been observed in the beaks of finches on the Galapagos Islands, changes uh, in bacteria uh, acquiring antibiotic resistance, and so on. In fact, such changes have been observed for centuries, long before Darwin, in the farmyard, in domestic breeding. This is also well established. But last point here, Darwinism extrapolates this uh, evidence for changes within species to account for the major changes we see in the fossil record. And this extrapolation, I maintain, is not well supported by the evidence. Next slide. Darwin's theory, briefly, which he called descent with modification, is this. If you look at the lower left, at A, uh, that would be one species. And every species, as we know, contains many varieties. If we look at the people sitting in this room, we see lots of variation. According to Darwin's theory, selective pressures from the environment over time cause that one population to diverge into several populations and so on and so forth over time until major differences arise. Now, if we look at the fossil record, next slide, please, we could imagine, this is actually an imaginary sequence, the record is nowhere near as good as this, but let's imagine a, a modern bird on the upper left, a modern whale on the upper right, and the creatures below it are uh, fossilized, uh, showing various conceivable intermediates between the modern bird the modern whale and their distant common ancestor, shown at the bottom. Uh, now, I don't claim that this is uh, uh, well established in the fossil record. As I said, this is a hypothetical sequence, although these are actual fossils. Now, according to Darwinism, changes in the population of that creature at the bottom over time gradually diverged and led to these major changes throughout time to give us the bird and the whale. But if we look at the changes, say, in the modern bird, as Darwin did, that's a pigeon at the top. Darwin looked at breeding within pigeons. The changes were nowhere near as dramatic. In fact, you always ended up with a pigeon. And if you released your selective pressure, you got back the pigeon you started with. So the question is, does the Darwinian mechanism really account for this sort of divergence that we would hope to see to account for large-scale evolution? Next slide, please. In a 1990 book uh, written by an Ohio State evolutionary biologist to defend the theory of evolution uh, and rebut creationism, Tim Berra used a sequence of Corvette automobiles to illustrate this uh, process of change over time. And he said, and this is from his book, if you compare a 1953 and 54 Corvette side by side and then a 54 and a 55 and so on, the descent with modification or Darwinian evolution is overwhelmingly obvious. 
Well, what's overwhelmingly obvious from this example, of course, is that what we, what we have here is not an example of natural Darwinian evolution, but an example of design. Each of these automobiles was designed by a team of engineers. They were patterned on the previous model, so to be sure there's a progression here. But what we do not have is variation and selection. What we have is design. Next slide, please. So clearly, the similarities that are often used to justify the extrapolation of the Darwinian mechanism to account for all of life's history uh, do not really demonstrate common ancestry. They are equally compatible with the notion of design. Now, I'm not saying they demonstrate design. I'm saying that the issue remains unresolved. The similarities could be due to either one. Next slide. Now, at the root of this issue of design is the following question. It's an important one. A lot of people see a lot of implications in it. They consider it very important for the way they live their lives, whether they answer it one way or the other. The question is, are or were all features of living things produced by undirected natural causes, as Darwin claims, or were some of them maybe not all, but some of them produced by an intelligent designer. This is an important question. How do we go about answering it? Well, if we try to answer it scientifically, first, design could be excluded by providing evidence for a mechanism sufficient to produce a particular feature. As I've just argued, the mechanism that Darwin proposed of selection and variation gets us changes within species, but it does not, does not get us the major innovations in the history of life that we expect to see in evolution. Uh, so this Darwinian mechanism uh, has been observed to produce, uh, I can't read the monitor so well here, a domestic breeding, okay, as I said, has been going on for centuries. Uh, the grants back in the 1970s and 80s uh, in a heroic uh, scientific research program has observed actual natural selection on the finch beaks of birds in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, what was interesting in that case is that the beaks, the average size of the beaks increased during a drought. As soon as the drought ended and the rains came back, the beaks went back to normal. So there was no net evolutionary change, but there was some evolutionary change. Uh, antibiotic resistance, we certainly observe this. It's important medically, but yet in 150 years of studying these bacteria, no one has observed the emergence of a new species. Where is the evidence that this mechanism could lead to what Darwin says it can do. Next uh, slide, please. On the other hand, we might answer this question philosophically. First, one could argue that the question of design is outside the realm of science. And I often hear this. But then, if it's outside the realm of science, evidence has no bearing on it at all. And yet, if you open almost any biology textbook or listen to almost any biology lecture, uh, or not almost any lecture, but any course in biology, you will hear at some point along the way evidence presented against design. And yet, if you try to raise evidence for design, if you try to argue that there's some evidence for design, you will quickly find yourself uh, marginalized, perhaps uh, ruled out of court. You'll be told that, that that question, that question of design, is not a scientific one, but a religious one. Well, if it were really not a scientific question, that evidence would have no bearing one way or the other. And that's not what we see. Second of all, <clears throat> the claim that design is outside of science is actually a claim that science is limited in its methods. If this were the case, the proper attitude of a scientist would be to express agnosticism about design. But instead, we find throughout the evolutionary biology community claims that, in fact, features of living things are not designed. So instead of agnosticism, we find a very dogmatic assertion excluding design. Next slide. Well, once we exclude design philosophically, of course, the only mechanism that's left, by and large, is variation and selection. And this is why it's extrapolated to explain the history of life, not because it's scientifically justified. So because Darwinism is basically philosophical, next slide. Uh, it tends to exclude counter evidence. Uh, first of all, it uh, ignores certain features of the fossil record, such as the Cambrian explosion, that are inconsistent with the branching pattern of Darwin's theory I showed you in the first place. Second of all, it ignores the limits of uh, natural selection. 
Third, uh, it fails to demonstrate that this mechanism could lead to the changes uh, that we see. Uh, and finally, uh, in practice, no amount of counter evidence is allowed to challenge the basic doctrine of dissent with modification. We hear constantly about disagreements among evolutionary biologists on this or that detail, but if you try to challenge the basic theory, you run into a brick wall because it's basically philosophical. And finally, my last slide, uh, first point, uh, is that uh, this control, rather than being maintained on the basis of evidence and scientific uh, argumentation, is actually based on political means. First of all, there's uh, control of academic positions and research positions, uh, control of search committees and tenure review committees. Second of all, there's a monopoly, a virtual monopoly, over public funding. Uh, I belong to several professional organizations that uh, routinely lobby Congress for more funds for uh, biologists committed to the Darwinian paradigm. Uh, and if a, a scientist applies for a grant that uh, attempts to challenge the Darwinian viewpoint or provide evidence for design, that biologist will quickly, quickly run into the brick wall I described a minute ago. Uh, next, uh, people who do uh, have the temerity to challenge this paradigm find themselves uh, suffering. Dean Kenyon was an acknowledged authority on the origin of life back in the 1960s, but when he had the nerve to, uh, in the course of a regular uh, curriculum uh, dealing with evolutionary biology, he had the uh, temerity to tell his students that he thought that life could not have originated without design based on the evidence that he saw, he was immediately suspended from teaching the same day and was reinstated only with the help of the American Association of University Professors and various legal authorities. Roger DeHart is a high school teacher uh, just north of where I live in Seattle, Washington, who has now been removed from his teaching position because he wanted to tell his students that pictures of embryos in their textbooks had been faked. And the way he wanted to do this is he wanted to give them an article from Natural History Magazine written by Stephen Jay Gould. He was prohibited from doing that and subsequently removed from his biology teaching position because students were not permitted to see evidence challenging the Darwinian viewpoint. I'm not saying that Stephen Jay Gould challenges that, but he was challenging evidence that was being used in his te textbook to support that theory, and he wasn't even allowed to do that much. And finally, uh, I am not imputing any of this to Professor Palumbi, but uh, in the course of my uh, travels, I find myself frequently subjected to personal abuse for even raising the issue of whether Darwinism is true. And uh, I find, in fact, that the word creationist is frequently used uh, as the functional equivalent now of communist during the McCarthy era. It effectively excludes people from the academic community, uh, can cost them their job, uh, and uh, it's basically name calling in place of good scientific argumentation. And so for these reasons, I argue that uh, Darwinism is uh, basically uh, a philosophical position maintained politically uh, through political means and uh, indoctrinating students in uh, high school classes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wells. Now let me turn to... Uh, <clears throat> now let me turn to uh, Professor Palumbi uh, to state his views. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really remarkable how, how much we, Dr. Wells and I, actually agree on in this particular forum, and I thought it'd be worthwhile spending a few minutes talking about those issues because that allows us then to, to branch off from a, a, firm, a firm base. Uh, we agree on a couple of really incredibly important points, and that, that there is a fossil history of life on Earth, and that that fossil history goes back billions of years. Dr. Wells' book, Icons of Evolution, talks about uh, the first fossil cells about three and a half billion years ago, and at that time, the life on Earth was very simple. Right now, life on Earth is enormously complicated. We've had to invent politics in order to encompass some of the complications that we experience. Um, but the biological world as we know it right now includes a huge number of very complex organisms, animals, plants, etc. Not all of those organisms e existed in the deep past. Uh, humans, for example, have a history of a couple million years. I, I was also pleased to see in Dr. Wells' book that, that uh, the discussion of the fossil history of humans is well established. But if you go back 50 million years, there are no humans. They're mammals, 
there are flowering plants, but no humans. If you go back 200 million years, there's no flowering plants or mammals. There's complex life, but it's different. If you go back 500 million years to the Cambrian explosion that Dr. Wells was talking about, then you also get a plethora of different forms, very different than we see together and than you see today. Uh, and what we see then in the fossil history of life is, is change. Now, if we start off with single cells three and a half billion years ago, and we have very complex life forms after that, then we fundamentally have two different ways we can think about that. Either the complicated forms of life we see now developed, evolved from the simple forms, descent through modification, as Darwin said, or there's another mechanism involved. There's, a, there's an alternative to that. That alternative was, was believed by Lamarck, for example, who believed that there was a biogenesis, that life forms spontaneously arose all throughout the history of life. They were continuously arising spontaneously, and that they were developing through their own internal um, changes over time. Uh, so we can agree on some really fundamental things. There is a history of life that goes back a long time, that life now is not the same as it was in the past, and that complex organisms now either arose from simpler ones in the past or they arose in some alternative way. Now, what's important in a scientific discussion is to lay out the alternatives and to identify the mechanisms of them. Uh, evolution by natural selection, descent with modification are some of those alternatives. And one of the questions that we might have is, what are the alternatives beyond those? Where does complex life come from if it does not arise from simpler life deeper in the past? The other things that we agree a lot about are that that history of life then, in fact, shows that things have changed. That's the fact of evolutionary patterns. And what it seems to me from Dr. Wells' comments, what we're really talking about is how to explain those evolutionary patterns, how we can tell what generated those patterns over time. Now, here, the evolutionary community is, in fact, trying to find answers. And there's an enormous amount of disagreement about that. Debates about punctuated equilibrium and gradualism over the last couple decades very much document the fact that evolutionary biology does allow dissent, but that's dissent about competing alternative mechanisms to generate a particular pattern. What kind of alternative mechanisms do we have available to us? There are a number of them, and what I'd like to do in this, the second couple of minutes is to flip to a totally different time scale and talk about something very different. That's the evolutionary process, because that's something else that Dr. Wells and I appear to agree enormously well on, that the evolutionary process that is natural selection and its impact on evolutionary change is, in fact, highly visible. It can occur within species. It can occur very quickly. And it can occur in ways that actually make a difference to how we live, we live our lives. And the example I want to use is evolution that's not happening over billions of years, but evolution that's happening over a period of days or weeks, and that's HIV. HIV is perhaps one of the, the most quickly evolving organisms that we know about right now. It evolves quickly it has a, because it has a high mutation rate and an enormously high replication rate. That mutation rate and replication rate means that it can evolve very quickly, not on the order of years, but on the order of weeks or months. In fact, if a person gets HIV, the first thing that happens is that that disease begins to evolve within them. It, is chased by your immune system so that every person that has the disease essentially evolves a new form of the disease that is tailored to escape your own immune system. Week by week, month by month, your immune system fights it and generates a pressure, a natural selection pressure that causes that virus to evolve. It evolves so quickly that it evades your immune system. And, and as some of you may, may know, in the process is, of course, eating your immune system. So your immune system gradually decays in its ability to fight back. That decay is, in fact, what causes AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And it's the evolution of the virus in the face of a, of a really good immune attack by your immune system that causes that disease. Now, that's evolution that's generated by natural selection, generated by your immune system. And it's something that we need to understand enormously well. We understand it pretty well right now. The implications of understanding it, though, are that we are in an arms race with this virus. And the virus is, in fact, 
evolving every time our immune system changes. Then, of course, we hit it with antiviral drugs, and it evolves even more. The point here is that understanding what's going on inside someone infected with HIV would be very, very difficult unless we understood and deployed our knowledge of the evolutionary process. That that's important for us, and it's important to teach our children about in schools. That process is, in fact, something we can observe not only in this one case, but we can observe it also going on around, around us in the world, as Dr. Wells points out, Darwin's Finches, a number of other uh, well-publicized examples. So we understand that the evolutionary process, particularly evolution by natural selection, does happen. It happens quickly. It happens so quickly that we do need to pay attention to it, and we do need to build it in to our curriculum, and we do need to have biology students in particular understand how evolution works. We can apply it as well to antibiotic resistance. Um, we know, for example, that in 1943, when penicillin was first deployed as a major antibiotic, that it took a fairly low dose to cure just about all major infectious diseases, not all of them, because some bacteria are naturally resistant to it. Well, within a few years, it took a lot more penicillin to do that. And by 1960s, we stopped using penicillin in hospitals to treat staph infections, and we used methicillin instead. And by the mid-1990s, there were so many cases of methicillin-resistant staph infections in hospitals that we started using something called vancomycin, the drug of last resort, more and more and more. Now, that's another evolutionary arms race, where we start with one drug, and we go to the next drug, and we go to the next drug, and along the way, we make our medicine very expensive. It costs dollars to treat a susceptible infection with penicillin. If you get a penicillin-resistant infection, it's $9,000 on, on your hospital bill. If you get a methicillin-resistant infection, it's $27,000 extra on your hospital bill. So our arms race with these infectious diseases, something that we can understand as an evolutionary process, is something we have to be able to deal with. That arms race becomes more and more expensive. We have to go beyond simply understanding the evolutionary process in this, in this way, and we have to be able to employ our understanding to slow down that process. Again, we return back to the subject of this forum, which, which is, is teaching evolution. Only by teaching how evolution happens, how this process works, can we in fact teach people how to slow it down in these arms races. So what we can see in these, these examples is that over billions of years, the fact of evolutionary change seems relatively well established, and that if there's going to be some other way of getting complex organisms out of simple ones, then that alternative needs to be spelled out in ways that all can see. That would be a scientific way of doing it. My view of science is that my job is to try to find natural explanations for patterns in the world. Natural explanations include descent with modification and natural selection and evolution. If there are alternatives to that, then they need to be laid out. We understand the process of evolution on the, on the other side, and we need to be able to explain to people how that works in such a way that middle school students and high school students can use that knowledge in the future. You desperately need your doctor to believe in evolution because you're going to come in with a resistant infection one day. That's the kind of teaching that has to go on in high schools. We don't need to teach high school students every single thing about evolution in just the few weeks that the subject is taught, but we do need to get these two kinds of things in their head, things that we agree about, Dr. Wells and I, that the fact of evolution over long periods of time and the fact of the process of evolution in short periods of time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Palumbi. Well, we've had statements of uh, two, at least somewhat different positions, uh, and now it's time for questions. We have about a half hour for questions. I would appreciate people who have questions. We have two microphones. If you would go to the microphones, and I'll try to go back and forth so that everybody has an opportunity. I would urge you to ask questions, please, rather than uh, making uh, additional uh, um, statements. Uh, and with that, uh, let's begin. Thank you. Um, you might identify who you are also. That's my name is Bill McCamley. I'm an NPP student here at the Kennedy School. In high school and in science, or in college science classes, 
I guess one of the basic things that I was taught was that all science, and one of the basic tenets of science was that it was testable. All aspects of a theory or a proposition needed to be able to be tested in order to be hopefully found out to be whether proved right or wrong. If you go back far enough in your uh, theory of design, you eventually come to a supernatural being that, or an intelligent designer that will design life. And I'm curious as to how, um, in this theory, you can basically test God and how that can be a science, if not the case. Thank you. Dr. Well. Good question. Uh, I'll say two things. First of all, uh, would you grant that it is conceivable that God created life and did some things in the history of life? I mean, it's at least theoretically possible. If that's the case, then to say that science cannot get at that is a statement that science cannot get at the whole of reality, which may very well be true. In other words, science is not in a position by saying, my method is limited to this, therefore reality doesn't extend beyond that. Okay, science can't do that. Now, in terms of testability, the second point I would make is, uh, I do not think that empirical science can get at the nature of the designer, if indeed there is one. I do think empirical science can get at whether a certain feature is designed. Now, this is a very controversial claim, uh, not accepted by the vast majority of biologists, certainly. But uh, there's a growing body of philosophical and biological thought that uh, we all infer design in our daily lives. We just do it on a daily basis. The question is, can you extend that to features of living things? Many people say no, some people say yes. I don't want to belabor the details of that, but it's a, it's a fascinating topic and uh, I think worth pursuing. Uh, books have been written about it. <clears throat> Dr. Plumby, do you want to uh, add something to that? Well, the, there's, that question has been asked for a long time and, and it, is, it is a good question. And the nature of, of the answer depends on how specific you want to get. And when I suggested that what we really need in order to make progress is for the alternatives to be laid out, what I really mean is, is those alternatives should be, a, should be either very specific, like, like intelligent design will do this, or they should be very general. Now, you can't test any of those unless you lay out the, those alternatives pretty well. And, and the nature of science, of course, is if I have a problem with an experiment and I, I publish a uh, an attack on that experiment and its interpretation, then I'm pretty much required to give an alternative explanation for the phenomenon. And once you have that alternative, you can use it in a testing framework. Now, now other people have asked that question to other evolutionary biologists, and, and evolutionary biologists have scratched their head and said, well, what you can conclude about the, the design designer is an in, in inordinate fondness for beetles, uh, because there are so many hundreds of thousands of beetle species in the world. Um, that's a flip answer, and I don't think it, it is, is a good answer for your particular question. Um, I would go back to the say, to this statement of what are all the alternatives? Once you have them laid out, you can begin to eliminate them based on the evidence. But we don't have those alternatives right now. Next question. Uh, we're here to talk about what you should learn in a, oh, by the way, I'm Fred Clark. I work in uh, Newton. Uh, what you should learn in the science classroom. Now, we can't prove that there was a designer or not a designer, but how does a designer help us solve the problem of the AIDS virus? And I guess both of you might like to comment. I mean, where does the designer come into that particular problem? And why would a science student in high school be interested in a designer for that question when similar ones? If you're looking at Dr. Wells, I assume you want, that to, want him to start. I have no idea. Uh, I don't see any reason to bring it in to that question. I mean, changes within species, including HIV, uh, are an observed fact. Uh, I don't see that we need to invoke a designer at all. Uh, what I would like to see taught in science classes is uh, an accurate representation of the evidence. Now, the evidence for changes within species is excellent. The evidence for using that to explain the entire history of life is pretty flimsy, in my opinion. And uh, I think students uh, deserve to be given a more critical reading of that particular line of argument. 
in science classes. Mm -hmm. um, there are, of course, been answers to that question uh, of why HIV exists at all. You could, you could talk about that from a, a designer's perspective. Um, again, it's not relevant to this particular question. Um, you can't test it. And, and I have to agree with Dr. Wells. In, in this case, the, the process is so clear and the implications are so clear that uh, we, we need very desperately to avoid the design issue when we're talking about a disease that could conceivably wipe out an entire generation in the continent of Africa and con could conceivably be a burning fire that unless we did something about it, we, it was gonna affect all of us. So, so the danger I think there is by including a designer in this argument, we could short circuit our ability to deal with this disease. That's, that's my fear about it really. Fine. Next question. My name is Dr. Hartman. I'm from MIT. <clears throat> First of all, biology is a historical science and should not be compared with physics and chemistry, which are experimental sciences. And therefore, you're as good as your records are. Now, the thing about Darwinism is that it's variation and natural selection. Variation is basically Mendelian and has to do with genomics. And there we have an enormously good record for evolution, and that's the sequence of DNA, bases in DNA in all organisms. The problem about natural selection is very, very complex because you can say that the uh, beautiful um, bird of paradise is based on the selection, the sexual selection of the female bird. So in my question to both of you actually, do you believe that evolution is a, is a historical science and therefore you're as good as your records? Is the DNA sequence in organisms a record of variation in, in, its, in its history? And second of all, is a selection by other organisms as good as design? Dr. Wells? Well, I, I certainly agree with you that uh, you initially said biology is a historical science. You meant to say, I guess, evolution is a historical science. Well, I, my biology is embryology, so that's experimental. But uh, evolution, we'll say evolution is a historical science. Uh, granted, and it's only as good as your records, and the records, unfortunately, are far from perfect. Now, the DNA sequences you're referring to, of course, are all in extant living organisms. So that's a pattern we see in the present. With the, through the spectacles of Darwinian theory, we extrapolate that into the past and try to come up with a pattern that we think happened in the past. But that's, uh, in my opinion, highly speculative. That's not a historical pattern. That's an inferred pattern based on the present. Um, Lynn Margulis agrees with you too, um, that in fact, when you build a phylogenetic tree with DNA sequences, that in fact you are generating a pattern and then you use that pattern to infer the evolutionary process. Um, I would disagree with you though that, that evolution is, is not an experimental science. We can do lots of experiments on the evolutionary process and we have done lots of experiments. Um, those experiments in fact have gotten so dull because the, in many senses the results are so, so expected that many people don't do them anymore. But there's a 50-year-old history of doing experiments in evolution, many in the lab, some in the field, um, better experiments, worse experiments. But it is an experimental science. And you can, for, exact, for, for example, understand better what drives evolution by experimentally manipulating one of the features of it. So people have done that to great, to great uh, advantage. But I do agree with the last part of what you said, that in fact natural selection is, is a very powerful force. And if you don't understand it, then in fact you could, you could invoke it in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. Um, you can imagine selection that will do just about anything uh, given strong enough selection and the variation in it. Um, you have to be careful about that as an evolutionary biologist and not invent wild selection schemes just because they, they might give you a convenient answer. Mm -hmm. Dr. Suit? I'm Herman Suit, a physician at the Mass General. I'd like, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Wells, my understanding from your position is that you consider that each of the living forms has had a special intelligent design and this is quite different from the concept that whatever entity is responsible for the universe or the universes uh, establish the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology and let them take their course. Uh, 
But over and above that, there is some entity which takes a particular interest in the design of all the innumerable number of species which you apparently acknowledge have gone extinct over the biological record going back about three and a half billion years. And so you have a supernatural entity which takes this kind of interest in all of these organisms. And I would like if you could explain how this differs from religion, because it seems to me when you invoke intelligent design, you're invoking religion, and therefore you're teaching religion in a science class. And I think science class should be devoted to science and religion in a religion class. Good question. Uh, you are indeed talking about religion here. Uh, you've given various descriptions of the, the way the designer might work. Uh, all of those are theological questions, which I find very interesting. Uh, I do not happen to think that it's necessary that the, the designer created every living species as is in its present form. Uh, the designer may indeed have created species to go extinct, I don't know. But again, that's a theological question. I agree with you that religion should not be taught in science classes, which is one reason why I'm such a strong critic of Darwinian evolution. Because I find that in the teaching of Darwinian evolution, in many of the textbooks I've looked at, for example, or in the PBS series that was recently released and is now being shown in public school science classrooms, uh, religion is a major issue. Only it's an attack on religion. Darwinism, in some hands, is used to attack religion, and I think that has no place in a science classroom either. I think that you're exactly right that there is a distinction that should be made, and one of the things we might, we might discuss is, is how you might, in fact, teach design uh, as a religious subject in a public school. We have a hard time with that in our, in our current system right now, and we don't seem to be able to get, get to that. I, I personally think that it would be reasonably a good idea to bring up issues of ethics and culture and religion in a, in a school system, even a public school system. I, I completely agree that it does not belong in a science class. Uh, so much has to be taught in science right now. We do not have the luxury of adding another whole curriculum to it. But how do we, how do we teach things outside of science that are these sorts of issues? I don't know that we know how to do that in this country, and it would be nice if we could figure out some way. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Miles Duffy. I'm at the Kennedy School. I have a question uh, for both of you about science education. Uh, Richard Feynman thought that there was a difference between teaching the findings of science and teaching people to do science. Um, and teaching the findings of science would be just communicating the results. As opposed to teaching people to do science would be teaching them the method of uh, hypothesis, trial, experiment, um, refutation. So my question is, do, for, for each of you, do, do you, which do you think uh, we do in America in science class, particularly at the lower education level? And uh, if you find that we're teaching only the findings of science, how would you change science education? Dr. Columbia, why don't you start this one? Sure. I, I, I think that what we do in this country is actively snuff out interest in science in, in our school system. Um, my two children, when they were young, were delightfully interested in the natural world and in many aspects of it. They wanted to know things. They wanted to know how things worked and why they worked. And by the time they got through middle school and by the time my, my son went through AP biology class, he really, really couldn't care less. Um, we do a very bad job at teaching people the wonder of exploration and the wonder of knowing. Science is a way of knowing things. It's not the only way of knowing things, but it is a very powerful way of knowing things. And, and I think we do a bad job of teaching our children to appreciate that and to know how to use it. Instead, we tend to shove facts down their throats. And that may be why, in fact, some of the textbook errors that Dr. Wells has rightly pointed out exist in textbook, because it's a series of facts that you want to get down that people can learn. Um, I think we do need to learn how to teach people to do science 
to appreciate it, appreciate its limits, and appreciate the power that it has. Uh, if we do that, we'll have, in fact, more ingenuity and people that are capable of absorbing those facts in a better fashion. I totally agree. <laughs> wow. Let me just add that I, I, I think it's important to teach the me method of science, that is experimentation, hypothesis, and so on. But I do think it's important to communicate the major findings as well, where those are well established. Uh, I like to see them communicated uh, as things that have been established by experiment but may be overturned, rather than as hardened dogmas that uh, must not be questioned. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes teachers cross the line. But I have great sympathy for teachers because they have a tough job, and uh, uh, it's, it's hard to do it right. But let me take the prerogative of my position here and ask you, I'd be very interested to hear if you were in charge of a science curriculum in an independent school, let's say, where the politics of it was a little bit aside. Uh, how would you, what would be an ideal curriculum from your point of view, an ideal biological curriculum? <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> Well, much of it would be unchanged, I think, from the standard curriculum. I mean, the, the, what we know about the cell and about DNA and about physiology and the, uh, the world of uh, plants and animals, uh, uh, much of that, I think, is, is taught fairly adequately. Uh, but we're talking about evolution here. I think I would try to teach them uh, something of what uh, Professor Palumbi does, uh, maybe with bacteria, not with HIV, certainly. but. Uh, maybe with some relatively innocuous bacterium, uh, try to design some simple experiment in the lab. Uh, I would also teach them evolutionary theory, the full extent of it. But I would take pains to show them where I think the evidence takes us and where we extrapolate beyond the evidence to make claims that are not necessarily empirically sound. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you would teach more a critical approach to Darwinian theory <coughs> rather than a curriculum that included uh, design and uh, intentional design? Uh, I don't know whether I would include that or not. I might, depending on the, uh, the circumstances. Uh, my feeling is that uh, students, certainly at the high school level and the college level, are uh, far more capable of sorting through uh, controversial and competing ideas than some people give them credit for. And I think it makes education a lot more exciting to mm -hmm. give them, you know, here are three ideas. You know, you take this side, you take this side, have a disagreement about it, and we'll see who uh, comes out uh, more persuasive or something like that. I've seen this actually done in English classes, believe it or not. It can't happen now in biology classes in public schools, but I've seen it in English classes and done to great effect. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Interesting. I believe you were next. Hi, my name is Alon Geva. I'm a freshman here at the college. And uh, Dr. Wells, I was wondering, you point out, and uh, rightly so, the um, holes in the logic of Darwinism. And my experience has been that many of uh, the better um, professors of uh, evolutionary biology also acknowledge these faults. But I haven't actually heard any of the, any discussion of evidence or lack of evidence for some sort of intelligent design theory. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, what evidence there we do have or where there isn't evidence and where we have to take things on faith. Well, the major uh, line of evidence that's been put forth so far uh, goes by the name of irreducible complexity. It's uh, promoted by a Lehigh University biochemist named Michael Behe, who wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And uh, Behe quotes Darwin to the effect that if, if there were any single feature of a living organism that could not be assembled, uh, I'm not using Darwin's exact words, but assembled piecemeal gradually through natural selection and variation, then his theory would break down. And Behe shows certain features of certain cells that he calls irreducibly complex. That is, if you don't have all the parts there in working order to begin with, the part has no function and therefore cannot be selected for. And uh, he claims that this uh, is evidence for design. Now whether his particular examples will survive scrutiny or whether that whole line of argument will survive scrutiny, I really don't know. But I think it's a legitimate question. I do think that evidence has a, a bearing on the topic. <laughs> 
It is a, good, a very good question. Um, irreducible complexity has been something that, that needs, needs to be explained, and I think it, it's a good example of a challenge to a Darwinian interpretation that, in fact, is easily meetable. It's important to challenge, to, to present the challenge, but it's also important to realize that you can meet that challenge. Um, Behe's book presents an enormous complexity in biochemical pathways and concludes that that complexity is irreducible because you can't remove any step and not have the whole pathway break down in examples, blood clotting. Um, yet, it's relatively easy to see how such a system of irreducible complexity can be derived from a simpler system. As long as you let the elements of a, of a particular system evolve with one another. One way to think about it is if you have a very complex system a number of elements are required right now. But in the past, it's possible that it was a simpler system. One of those elements duplicated in evolution. A gene could have duplicated. That's well known. The gene functions could have diverged and come to rely on one another to the point where a system that wasn't re irreducibly complex in the past now is. Again, I think what we have to do with that kind of example is to incorporate it in our thinking about something. It's an alternative. It's a challenge. You get through the challenge by seeing whether or not what you know about the current process of evolution is capable of explaining it. I think it's perfectly capable of explaining irreducible complexity without having a designer involved. Um, the examples in Behe's book I don't think require it. It's possible that other examples in the future will be stronger and we, we can see, meet those challenges as they come. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mike Cuban. I've been arguing with creationists for about two and a half decades, um, <laughs> just a beginner. Um, Dr. Wells, you're, you're a member of a think tank that engages in essentially public relations strategies to push your point in, in the political community. And as such, I wonder how we can trust these kinds of arguments. And you know, we're, we're all familiar with the, the efforts of other think tanks that have been pushing many kinds of arguments. And, so, so I wonder what your, your you know, how, how you would defend certain kinds of, of strategies that I observed in your, your talk, which essentially boil down to, to what looked to me like the big lie technique of projecting your own um, problems onto those of your opponents, such as your conspiracy theory of their invisible beings, so, you know, whether it be God or six giant white invisible rabbits and, or devils that are causing evolution, you have to find a conspiracy theory of um, naturalism in, in evolution. Um, you accuse evolutionists of dogmatism, as if that wasn't the most notorious feature and salient feature of creationists. Uh, you talk about how evolutionary people are, are really trying to get political control of schools and all that sort of thing, but you're in an institute that I don't see hiring any Darwinists. Um, you talk about the, the creationist literature is renowned for systematic errors, failures, lies, and things like that, and so you seem to be projecting that on evolutionary science in your book. And um, I, I just would like to know how, is how you, question? whether this, yes, I'd like to know if th this is a, a what deliberate. What excuse do I have? Um, public relations technique. I mean, these are well-documented scientific techniques for influencing people. This is political issue, right? We're here for politics as well as science. And so I'd like to know how you defend these sorts of public relations stratagems. Well, I'm not sure you've really pinpointed a whole lot. Uh, you say I uh, point to lies or distortions in the teaching of Darwinism. Did, did, is that did what you, I heard you say? You, you wrote a book on I wrote a book about that. Icon. It's so. true. And you can read the book and see for yourself. Well, I've happened. known about many of them for many years. OK, and so they're there. Now, are they typical of, of evolutionary thought? I find that they are. And they're also defended with some uh, vehemence by many, uh, my, by many Darwinists. Now, you used the word evolutionist. I didn't. I'm happy uh, to work I'm talking, with the word Darwinist. I'm talking just, about no. people with a particular philosophical agenda here. Uh, but let me get to the think tank. Now, issue. there you are saying they have a philosophical agenda when you definitely have one. Oh, is sure that projection? I uh, sure I, I do. Is I, that projection? I never deny it. Of course I have a philosophical agenda. Everybody has a philosophical agenda. Is it unanimous the way yours is? Not to. They don't have one. Let me just answer your uh, think tank uh, objection. 
Uh, yes, I am affiliated with a think tank. Uh, there may be other people here affiliated with think tanks, heaven forbid. Uh, but the difference for me is this. Darwinism right now holds a monopoly over our public school system, our public money. That to me is wrong. I'm not saying it should go away. It's a, you know, it's a philosophical position. I love philosophical positions. I love to argue. I wouldn't want it to go away. But I think its monopoly is illegitimate. Just as I would argue that a monopoly over that public school system by biblical creationists would be illegitimate. We're talking here about the public square and the legitimate use of public money. And I think what we need here is a forum where opposing viewpoints can be discussed, not a monopoly by one viewpoint. Reading, and that's why I object to the Darwinian also also monopoly. I think we're ready to move on. Do you have a song? Yeah, I, I think it, this, it's, it's an important an important issue. I, I, I disagree with Dr. Wells that, that the monopoly on our public school system is, is a terrible thing um, because I don't see there being a monopoly. What we don't have and what we haven't heard tonight is what the alternative is. And until you know what the alternative is and whether you can address it as science, then you can't actually say that we have a monopoly because you have no alternative. What is the alternative to teaching evolution as a science in science classes? Unless it's on the table, unless we can evaluate it as an alternative, then we don't have anything else. What's done in evolutionary biology class is for the mechanism and the process of evolution to be extrapolated. That is not unusual in science. In fact, it's one of the most exciting things about science. And to call that a monopoly of one process on how we view the, the history of life, I, I think, is wrong. Um, we do need to have alternatives brought up, and evolutionary biologists do bring up alternatives. Lamarckianism was an alternative to Darwinism that was repudiated in the 1930s and 1940s uh, at, at its very latest. Could it be that other alternatives come up and can be debated, tested, and looked at? Absolutely. That needs to be taught in our public schools, the method of doing that, um, as well as the facts of the history of life as we've been We've been talking about them. Do you want to pick up the alternatives question? Or I guess you did a little. Well, bit. I addressed that in your question to me about what kind of a curriculum I would design. Uh, on this issue of we have to have alternatives, uh, let me say this. I, to some extent, I agree with you. But to another extent, to another degree, I don't. And that is this. Uh, to, a bad scientific theory does not necessarily need an alternative to be dropped. If I were to tell everybody here, I, I love hitting this microphone. If I were to tell everybody here that I had a theory of gravity that things should fall upwards, nobody would need an alternative theory to tell me I'm wrong. Obviously, the theory is wrong. If the theory doesn't fit the evidence, it should be discarded and not be held on to until there's some alternative to replace it. And I think that's the case with some of the claims of evolutionary theory. We have just a few minutes left, so maybe we should have quick questions and quick answers. Next. Okay, my name is Wayne. Uh, Dr. Palomi talked about rapid change in the causes of human ailments to explain the Im importance and implications of understanding the process for and mechanism of change over time. And it sounded like Dr. Wells agrees with that. And so I wonder, Dr. Wells, if you can talk a little bit about the importance and implications of thinking about um, certain things in the light of uh, intelligent designer. Well, I, I'm not sure what I agreed with. I, I certainly agree with changes within species, which are well documented and which Professor Palumbi knows better than I. Uh, I have no problem with that. The question is, do those changes also explain the major changes we see in the history of life? And I think that's, as I've already said, I think that's where evolutionary theory is on very thin ice. Uh, how would intelligent design help? Uh, well, at the very least, it uh, relieves us from the obligation to plug in a natural explanation even where it doesn't fit the evidence. It allows us to say, well, we just don't know. For example, about 530 million years ago, virtually all the major forms of animals appear in the fossil, let's go again, uh, appear in the fossil record uh, fully formed, the major forms. Uh, with no fossil evidence that they shared a common ancestor. This is not what Darwin expected. He himself acknowledged that it was a serious problem for his theory. Uh, someone committed to Darwinian, Darwinian evolution uh, 
is continually manufacturing uh, the equivalent of Ptolemaic epicycles, those little squiggles that Ptolemy put on his picture of the heavens to try to explain why this happened. Uh, when in fact, it seems to me perfectly leg legitimate to say, well, we don't know how it happened. Maybe it involved something that we can't get at with our methods. And design, to me, at least, frees us to do that. In a, it like you might have something to say about that. In a debate or in a, in a discussion like this, it's really important to use your words carefully and to also present the facts or the, the information in as complete a way as possible. When Dr. Wells says all of the major forms of animals were around 530 million years ago, Almost. he, of course, doesn't mean that. Um, there were no mammals 530 million years ago. There were no flowering plants 530 million years ago. There were no coral reefs 530 million years ago. There were many animal phyla, many of which are extinct now, but we know from the fossil record that, in fact, organisms have appeared in the history of life over time. Now, I could tell a fifth grader that all the major forms of life appeared 530 million years ago, poof, and they would believe me. Or I could tell them that, in fact, different forms of life have appeared in the fossil record over time. Now, I personally think it's very important to explain those kinds of things to people in as clear a way as possible. I think by saying all those things appeared all at once, that that's an inaccuracy, that that is not the way the fossil record looks, and that it leads you to a conclusion that is not, in fact, correct. So I, I do disagree with that vehemently, and I think it's a way that we have of influencing how our children think about things that we have to be extremely careful about. We can teach them what to think about things by using half-truths, by not presenting all the evidence, and by not allowing the scientific method, here I do it too, not allowing the scientific method to, to take full reign. Now, this could also be applied to the use of evolutionary theory in its modern uh, framework. Um, we have to be careful on both sides. Um, what we have to do, though, is to present the facts that are there in a way that people can actually see what they really are. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, my name is Julie, and I'm from the college. Um, I wanted to ask you a question more about the methods of determining phylogenetic evolution, uh, evolutionary trees, and just sort of about the strengths and weaknesses um, that I'm sure you both know a lot about of methods like cladistics or taking different characteristics of species and comparing them to determine a common ancestor or sort of develop a tree. Because I know there's holes in using that, yet there's also a lot of support for it. So just both of you. Jefferson Hall, 2.50, noon on Friday. <laughs> That's my lecture on phylogenetic reconstructions <laughs> in my evolutionary biology class. Um, Phylogenetic reconstructions are, way, are ways of organizing information about existing species. There are very few cases in which we have data for fossil species from DNA. There are, of course, many cases in which we have data for fossil species from morphology um, and, and, and other sources. Um, those are ways of taking data and combining the information. Now, you can do that in a lot of different ways, um, and in fact, Cladistics is one way, parsimony is another way, and if you want to talk about philosophical positions in science, the cladis, the cladists and the people who support parsimony go at it more with more acrimony than any biologist I can imagine. Um, yet they both agree you can take this complex set of information and begin to distill patterns out of it. They are just patterns. And they are hypotheses about the relationships of things. The strongest way of using a phylogenetic perspective, in my opinion, is to use a data set to generate a hypothesis about relationships and then test those hypotheses with independent data sets. You'll see a lot of that in, in the literature. You'll see a bunch of it on Friday. Well, about uh, phylogenetic trees, I would just say that they, they invariably and necessarily assume that the organisms being studied share a common ancestor. They operate on that assumption and then use present characteristics to construct a probable pattern. Uh, they in no way constitute evidence for that common ancestry claim, which is taken as an assumption to begin with. Uh, second of all, uh, at, at some levels at least, phylogenetic trees have been uh, causing problems. It seems that the more molecules we study, for example, in certain molecular phylogenies, the messier things get. And so 
the original expectation was, as you study more molecules, the tree will get refined and refined until we really have an accurate picture of what the true relationships were, when in fact, uh, it gets worse every time we open up a new molecule. Uh, and let me just briefly respond to the implication that I was uh, playing fast and loose with my language. It's true, I did say the major forms of animals. Uh, if I had said most of the major phyla, would everyone here have understood me? Most would. Okay, well, you're quite right. It was the major phyla, but these are the major groups of animals, and they did all appear pretty much fully formed in the Cambrian explosion. Okay, we have two <coughs> last questions. One here. I am <coughs> Michael Barr from the Extension School. Um, I would agree with Dr. Wells' position that, or I should say, with that Darwin's um, is essentially a philosophical position, or at least better than a scientific, in a sense that I think Dr. <coughs> Palumbi illustrates with doctors who are currently trying to understand the AIDS virus who are evolving in understanding of it, basically. Um, my question, however, is that AIDS is essentially a destructive process. It's, I mean, it's, it's destructive in its effects. And I think we want to distinguish between design, which is creative, and AIDS, which is destructive. I mean, anything that's destructive is, well, it's, it's, destruction is basically much, much more rapid. <laughs> it, we can easily destroy things than we can create. Um, I, I guess my, my comment that would, uh, I would uh, uh, add to that would be that I partly feel that the wonder in science is missing because we're kind of timid about teaching that there is intelligence behind the design of the universe. I think if we, if we assert that there is intelligence, that there's possibly a being behind the design of the universe, then that would, that would create a much more secure feeling that it would, it, we wouldn't be stuck with science being a, a pure mechanism. Any comments? The, um, the assertion that there's intelligence beside, at the base of the universe is, is something that you, your, you yourself might feel. And you have the right to teach your children to feel that. The real question is, do you have the right to teach my children to feel that if I don't feel that? And if it's not a scientific issue and you're teaching that in a science class, I don't think you have the right to teach my children that. You have the right to teach my children that people believe that in an ethics class or a religion class, and I think that would be enormously valuable to them. But I think one of the issues here is what we call science and then how we decide what it is going to be. Now, you might think that the intelligent design that you have in your mind is the same as everyone, else, everyone else's and that it's okay to teach everyone's children that, but everyone might have a slightly different version of that. And until we know what version is going to be taught, then I don't want it taught. Now, we do know what the evolutionary process is and what evolutionary theory is, and I can look at a textbook and I can say, along with Dr. Wells, look, this just doesn't work for me, but in fact, this won't go, won't be, I won't be able to see what those alternatives really, really are. Dr. Wells? Well, the, the flip side of the coin, I would say, is that uh, by the same token, students should not be taught that there is no intelligent design behind the universe. And unfortunately, that's currently being done in many biology classes. I'm not claiming that it happens here at Harvard. I don't know what happens here at Harvard, but I have seen it. I have seen it in textbooks, uh, and it certainly goes on. And I think that's Ill an illegitimate use of science right there. And second of all, uh, you mentioned design in the AIDS virus. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the nature of the designer is not something I think that science can get at. Uh, that involves theological and philosophical issues which go far beyond the evidence. Uh, it could very well be the case, and I, I know a good friend of mine who believes this, that the designer was thoroughly evil and designed everything you know, very carefully to make us miserable. I mean, that's <laughs> theoretically possible. I don't believe that. That's, but that's, that's not what I'm in. in no, no, I, I know you're not. But uh, uh, the, what I'm saying is that the presence, the presence of HIV, AIDS, or evil in the world uh, does not necessarily reflect against design. It may say something distant about the designer, but there could still be design, even if it's evil design. Last question. All right, my name is Jerry Wasserberg. I'm professor of geology and geophysics at Caltech and Harvard. 
I have a question for Dr. Wells. First, there's a statement of fact. The time scale is not 6,000 years, and it is not 6 billion years. It's 4.5 billion years, and I will give you more decimal places. So that basic thing is not a number to be tossed around for which I have some credentials to speak. Secondly, I find it remarkable in your designing a curriculum as to why you absent the presentation of the fossil record and geological time as an intrinsic part of an education so that people have some perspective. That reappeared later in the discussion, but in your laying out what you would claim is a format for instruction, this was totally absent. And as a person who has been quite against many aspects of, in quote, literal Darwinism, I find nonetheless that the fossil record and the geological time scale is an imperative part of this understanding of any form of evolution. And why was this not, you think, an intrinsic part of the discussion, including all the possible failures of possible Darwinism, sir? Well, I, I would have no problem including that in the curriculum, but I didn't, I don't recall listing any of the details. I said I do think Darwinism, Darwin's theory, the whole range of evolutionary theory should be taught and the evidence that's consistent with it, as well as evidence that may challenge it. Mm -hmm. So I have no quarrel with you on that. Well, I wonder uh, we, uh, if either of our speakers or both of them have a couple of things to say that they haven't had a chance to say before this as we wind up. I actually, I actually have a question and, and that for, for Dr. Wells, and that's the, the nature of, of your interest in Darwinism and, and the nature of your interest in undermining it. And, and that comes from your history in your first PhD and then, and then your second PhD. The, the real question is, what is the real philosophical point? What is the philosophical underpinnings that, that you feel are, are so important that Darwinism is completely incompatible with those? Um, information on websites uh, has said that that point is, is that God has a plan for people and, and that you had a mission to destroy Darwinism when you started your, your PhD. I don't, I don't think taking stuff off websites is, is fair. And so what I wanted to do is simply ask, what is the history of that? Um, is, is what's on this website true? Did you go into your two PhDs in order to destroy Darwinism as others have tried to destroy Marxism according to the, the information there? Or did you come to the idea that Darwinism was not a correct view after the biology PhD? I did not come to the view that Darwinism was incorrect after the biology PhD. Um, I, my first PhD in religious studies was actually, my, I did my research on the nature of the conflict between Darwinism and Christianity. Uh, I was curious, actually. I wanted to know, well, is it uh, over biblical chronology? Is it over the origin of the soul? Now, this is a theology PhD. Uh, what was, the, what was the issue? And the issue uh, in the 19th century turned out to be design. Chronology played almost no role in the 19th century debates. I found that very interesting. Uh, by that time, I was convinced, uh, both because of that and because I had been studying biology along the way, that the larger philosophical claims of Darwinism were false. That is, the denial of design which you find throughout The Origin of Species, you find in people like Richard Dawkins, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, this explicit denial of design. I was uh, committed, I felt committed to discrediting that. When I went into my biology PhD at Berkeley in 1989, uh, at that point I still accepted most of what I had learned about evolution. I accepted descent with modification. I accepted universal common ancestry. It was during my biology PhD when I started looking at the, at the evidence, starting with the embryos, uh, I realized that the evidence for those claims had been severely distorted. And in my opinion, those claims themselves were based on a philosophical foundation. So I became even more skeptical. 
through my biology PhD. But I, I started out being very skeptical of Darwinism. Your time was in response to his question. Did you have something else that you would like to say to sort of wind up? Well, I just, I think, obviously, I've, I've devoted my, you know, two PhDs. Who, who the heck gets two PhDs uh, on this particular topic from two different angles? Obviously, I find this issue tremendously interesting. Uh, I think it's uh, a pivotal issue for our culture right now. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation to Professor Palumbi for being uh, so cordial. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I often get uh, attacked more personally than I have been here. I want to thank the JFK School for sponsoring this. And I've had a great time. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. I want to thank both our speakers for uh, presenting their views so clearly and uh, so with, in a, such an interesting fashion. I want to thank the students who uh, were the uh, stimuli for this evening and announce that uh, for those of you who are interested in hearing uh, more about this subject from uh, Dr. Wells, he will be giving a lecture tomorrow night, Thursday night at 8 p.m at Emerson Hall, room 108. The title of the lecture is Icons of Evolution. Uh, again, it's Emerson Hall, room 108, uh, at 8 PM. And uh, thank you both. Thank you. That's good. I jump thank over you. the chair, but I break my leg. <laughs> I really did enjoy that. I, I actually enjoyed it as well. Okay. You know? Thank you. You did a great job. You're welcome. Both of you guys are great. <laughs> you did a good job. Can we, can we meet the crew? Hi, Herman.